everyone. Welcome to our 11th lecture in Chemistry 51C here at UC Irvine. It's fall 2020 and we're in the middle of the campus shutdown, maybe the global shutdown due to the coronavirus pandemic. And <clears throat> for some reason, I, I seem to be gravitating towards interesting things that come from the distant past. And so today I'm going to talk about polyvinylidene chloride. And it was a discovery made by a college intern named Ralph Wiley. Uh, maybe just like you, this is a person who uh, somehow had a contact who knew somebody at Dow and it kind of started to fall through. So he showed up on their doorstep and um, basically <laughs> would not let it go until he was hired on as an intern. And I couldn't find a picture of Ralph Wiley as a college student. So I've inserted some random picture of a chemistry nerd from the 1930s. Kind of reminds me of me. I remember I had an internship at IBM when I was an undergraduate at the University of Texas. And my first day I showed up wearing a tie and everybody was looking at me like, uh, dude, we don't wear ties here. We're scientists and engineers. Um, kind of embarrassing in retrospect. Uh, but Ralph Wiley, <clears throat> when he was hired as a chemistry intern, of course, you never know anything when you first start off at a job or in a research lab. And they didn't trust him. I think they did not trust him to be doing any actual chemistry here inside the lab. This isn't necessarily the lab he worked in. This is a picture of one of the Dow laboratories uh, from about seven years earlier. And so he was initially assigned just to wash glassware. You know, here's a bunch of glassware. We've been using it all day. Get it clean so it's ready for the next day. <clears throat> and what he observed when he was washing the glassware, one of the things that his laboratory was working on is they were distilling tetrachloroethylene, perchloroethylene. And the main contaminant that, you, or that you're trying to distill that away from is a more volatile compound that has only two chlorines, dichloroethylene. And what Ralph noted was that um, the beakers and the test tubes and things that were contaminated with the dichloroethylene could not be cleaned if they sat around for too long. The, whatever was in there stuck to the, the glassware pretty much permanently. <laughs> it was some sort of a plasticky material. And his boss told him, well, you know, our, our lab is really focused on the tetrachloroethylene, the perchloroethylene stuff. Stay focused on that. Don't worry about that. Well, he didn't let it go. And, and that sticky stuff, that polymer, turned out to be a major product for Dow Corporation. The, the company ended up hiring him, uh, uh, Ralph Wiley, who had a successful career at Dow um, after he graduated from college. Let's go ahead and take a look at what do you do with this kind of um, this plastic that seems to stick, to cling to everything? Well, <clears throat> let's first take a look at the chemistry that was going on inside those test tubes. When, when the vinylidene dichloride, vinylidene chloride sat around in the presence of even the slightest quantity, just a whiff of radicals, any radical will add to this alkene, uh, the way I'm showing it over here using these half arrows um, in order to make a new bond. And it generates a new radical. Here it is, I've drawn it on between the two chlorines. And that will then add to another dichloroethylene, another vinylidene chloride, in order to make another carbon-carbon bond right here. And then that reveals a new radical that then makes another carbon-carbon bond. And that will continue until you've polymerized every single molecule of vinylidene chloride in the beaker. Um, <clears throat> and so that's what was happening inside the beaker as this stuff was exposed to oxygen or air, is it was, it was generating polyvinylidene chloride. So what do you do with this clingy, sticky plastic? Well, what Dow figured out how to do uh, within 10 years was to make plastic seat covers out of it. So maybe if, if car manufacturers are tired of using natural materials like leather, they decided, let's take something that's super sticky and clingy and make seat covers because I think everybody loves to have their legs, sweaty legs, stick and cling uh, to plastic seat covers. Uh, I'm just joking there, but. Um, maybe people didn't wear shorts or short skirts or something at the time. Um, well, that's what Dow did. It took them about 10 years to figure out a, a really good application for this stingy, uh, this sticky, clingy plastic. 
what they ended up doing is marketing this in thin, thin, transparent sheets as wrapping for food. And it was known as saran wrap. So from about 1949 to 2004, all the plastic wrap that you buy in the grocery stores to put on your food uh, was referred to as, I, I always called it saran wrap. <laughs> um, and saran is the name of the polymer that Dow marketed under the name saran. And that's the polyvinylidene chloride that, uh, that Ralph uh, discovered when he was an undergraduate. Now, whenever I see carbon chlorine bonds, I get a bit edgy about that. Organochlorine compounds have a tendency to turn into carcinogens in the human liver. No, no normal person would go around eating plastic wrap. That doesn't make any sense. Um, and it would probably pass right through your digestive system un, unprocessed. But it's always a concern. And so in 2004, um, they stopped making these plastic wraps, the saran wrap, uh, out of saran and started making it out of polyethylene, which is just a simple, simple polymer of ethylene molecules. And even if it's not quite as clingy, it still has some of these properties. You know, saran is completely impermeable to water and to oxygen. So if you're trying to keep your food moist and keep the oxygen out so it doesn't um, get stale, you know, the saran polymer is hard to beat. But polyethylene is pretty good. And I still refer to this cling wrap, even though it's made out of polyethylene, I still refer to it as saran wrap, even though it has no, none of the saran polymer in there. You know, what's the lesson here for you? Maybe it's not so much a lesson about uh, radical polymerization or polyvinylidene chloride, but it's a lesson about what are you going to expect if you get an opportunity, if you seize an opportunity like an internship. It's not going to be in some glamorous place or glamorous laboratory where you're doing some glamorous job. You're going to end up with some rinky-dink job to start off with as washing glassware, do, doing something simple. But it'll be around people that you respect and that respect you. You work hard, you make the most of your opportunities, and it will take you places. So have reasonable expectations about your first job. Um, and, and then make something out of that, those kinds of opportunities. Let's go ahead and talk about <clears throat> some more amazing carbonyl chemistry. <clears throat> So on, on Monday, when we left off, I had introduced you, we, we talked a lot about the Wittig reaction and maybe some formation of cyanohydrins. But just as we left off, I introduced this concept of condensing primary amines. That's amines with two hydrogen atoms with carbonyl compounds like ketones and aldehydes. And when you do that, we generate CN double bonds. So you can take CO double bonds of aldehydes and ketones, not esters, not amides, aldehydes and ketones, and you can condense them with amines uh, to give, uh, you can condense them with carbonyl groups to give uh, imines. That's imines with an I, as opposed to amines with an A. So th these are called imines, and I expect you to know how to synthesize imines. I told you we need a very specific weak catalyst for this reaction, acetic acid. I don't want you to write weak acid because that implies that nobody knows what it is. I want you to write acetic acid. Or you can draw out the molecular formula for acetic acid as long as you get the molecular formula right. Um, but that's the catalyst that, that we use for this reaction. And I gave you a mechanism. It's painfully long mechanism that I expect you to know. This is one of the most important mechanisms in organic chemistry. And so let's go ahead and talk about a related condensation where instead of taking primary amines with two H's, we instead take secondary amines that have only one H. So let me give you some examples of, uh, of condensation using secondary amines. And I'm going to start off by taking, um, <clears throat> by taking a ketone. And this is super important that it has to have a hydrogen atom at the carbon atom adjacent to the carbonyl carbon. So right here at this adjacent to the carbonyl carbon, there's a methyl group. And that methyl group has three hydrogens. We need at least one on there. And we're going to condense this with a secondary amine. We'll talk more about the naming of amines. A secondary amine that has one hydrogen atom. So with imines, where you form a CN double bond, we had two hydrogens on the amine. And here we've only got one. And we're going to use the same conditions that we did for imine formation. I told you there's a weak acid catalyst. It's the same weak acid catalyst here. It's catalytic 
acetic acid. I'll write out the molecular formula here. There's one way to do it, CH3CO2H. And under those conditions, <clears throat> we're going to condense these two components. We don't get a CN double bond in our product. We generate an alkene in the product. There it is. And the nitrogen atom is now joined where the carbonyl used to be. This is a, a, a more, um, seems like a more tricky transformation. Now I'm going to draw the byproduct in this reaction. And, and usually we're not interested in this byproduct. It, you usually war, work up organic reactions with some sort of work up to remove water. We would throw that away. We don't isolate the water. But if I asked you what happened in this reaction and you tell me, oh, I, I formed a CN double bond, you're not seeing the whole picture. I would hope that the, that the answer you would first tell me when I ask you what happened in this reaction, I would hope that you would say, oh, I lost an H from the carbon. This is one of the things that tricks up, trips up and tricks people the most when they go from Chem 51B to the third quarter Chem 51C of organic chemistry is that they are not able to see the hydrogens that aren't explicitly drawn, right? There's a hydrogen that just got lost. We started off with two hydrogen atoms, with three hydrogen atoms on this carbon atom. And the key thing that happened mechanistically is that we lost a hydrogen atom. Here's one of those hydrogen atoms in, in red over here. There it is. The hydrogen atom that used to be ends up, one of them ends up in water. The other hydrogen atom that we had in this reaction mixture, I'll go ahead and color it in green, came from this amine NH. There's the other one. And then the oxygen obviously came from the carbonyl. We'll talk about that mechanism. So again, it's not just that you're forming a CC double bond when you make this species called an enamine. Let's go ahead and talk, let's go ahead and um, make a point of the name of this species. It's called an enamine. It's like an alkene. It's like an amine, it's called an enamine, kind of makes sense. So I hope you, even if it's not drawn for you, I hope you can see that you lose a hydrogen. You have to have a hydrogen next to the carbonyl in order for this to, in order to form an enamine. Um, so that carbon next to the carbonyl, so it has to have an enamine. Okay, so let's go ahead and take another example. Really, the problem is that is if, if we take an example like, um, whoop, let me uh, go ahead and change to, um, to a black, uh, a black drawing pen here, black ink color. So if I condense this with another amine, and let me, it, this is probably a, a more common version of the reaction. You use a slightly heavier, dimethylamine is, is um, extremely volatile. I think it's a gas at, or at or close to room temperature. And so nobody wants to work with this. Usually people work with this five-membered ring amine which is called pyrrolidine. There's another six-membered ring amine called piperidine, and those are extremely common. Uh, they're liquids at room temperature, so they're easy to work with. And we can do this same kind of condensation reaction using catalytic acetic acid. And we're gonna lose two H's and an O from, from the starting materials. Let's go ahead and draw out the product of this reaction, acetone has methyl groups, two methyl groups on it. And so there's six hydrogens. So we can lose one of those hydrogens in order to make an alkene. And you can't control which side you form the alkene on. Now in this case, it doesn't matter, which is pretty fortunate. But if you're unfortunate enough to have a ketone that has different alkyl groups on each side, well, you're not going to have any control or good control over which side forms the alkene. So we tend to use this more commonly in cases where it doesn't matter which side loses the hydrogen. So in this case, I'll have the alkene form over here uh, on, on the right-hand side, but you have no control over that in these reactions. And of course, uh, I'll, I'll, just because we're calling it a condensation, I'll write the water byproduct. But usually on the exams, I'll tell you, draw the organic product. I don't really care about the water. Uh, nobody, nobody's trying to isolate the water in these reactions because um, that comes right out of your faucet. Okay, so again, it, it, this is a reaction that is best carried out using symmetrical ketones because then we don't have to worry about which side forms the alkene uh, because you don't have to control it. You'll get the same uh, product regardless of which side loses the hydrogen atom. Let's go ahead and take a look at the mechanism for this reaction. It, it, it's, a lot of it is very similar to the, whoa, I think my uh, 
give me a minute here. There we go. <laughs> Had a hard time getting that, uh, <clears throat> that next slide. Let's go and talk about the mechanism for this reaction. And I hope as we're walking through this mechanism that it looks extremely similar to the mechanism that I gave you for imine formation, because it is. Right up to the last step, it's the same mechanism. Now, I, this time I'm going to draw the amine has only one H and two R groups on there. So I'm going to abbreviate that amine with R2, I'll, I'll draw it as the molecular formula, NH. But again, the, with imines, we had to have two H's on the nitrogen. Here we've only got one H on the nitrogen. And so <clears throat> we're going to have a lone pair on that nitrogen and it's going to attack. I'll do this mechanism with, uh, with acetone here. <laughs> And so we're going to attack that acetone. Let me draw an arrow for the next step. There we go. Let's start off with that. Attack the carbonyl. Give the electrons to the carbonyl. I hope that's starting to feel so natural to you, that, that process of adding nucleophiles, whether it's organolithiums, organomagnesiums, nitrogen lone pairs, I hope that's starting to feel extremely natural to you. Okay, let's go ahead and draw that out with that new carbon-nitrogen bond. And we've pushed the electrons up to the carbonyl oxygen. So I'll put O minus there. And down over here, I'll try to sketch in the things that are attached to that nitrogen. We don't need to see all of these things yet, but there's that ammonium group, onium. That means there's a positive charge on there. Oxonium is oxygen with a positive. Ammonium is nitrogen with a positive. And then we have this alkoxide anion. And this is these next few steps here is where the acid really comes into play the weak acid species that we've got in, in our reaction mixture. So I'm going to, uh, I'm not going to draw acetic acid. For arrow pushing mechanisms, it's always easier to uh, use HA as a symbolic acid for curved arrow mechanisms. So let's go ahead and draw out this, the protonation of that alkoxide. So I'll go ahead and pick up the proton. And then we'll release our conjugate base when we, when we do that proton transfer step. And when we do that, we, we've now generated this conjugate base. And I'm going to draw that conjugate base just kind of hanging out down near this ammonium ion. <clears throat> because I've done this mechanism enough to know that our next step is going to be deprotonation of the ammonium ion, which will regenerate our acid catalyst. And I'll give the electrons to the nitrogen. We're going to see a lot of that in, in a few chapters when we cover our chapter on amines, just uh, acid-base reactions of amines, of ammonium and uh, compounds and amines. So the next step generates this neutral intermediate that I'm going to refer to as a carbonyl amine. It's, I'm not sure you need to know that name, but if you hear me use the word carbonyl amine, I've mentioned it before. This is the the carbonolamine intermediate that I mentioned in our, in our imine forming reaction. And now we've regenerated uh, our weak acid, the acetic acid or other acidic species that are present in our reaction mixture. And it's this next step which really requires you to have just slightly, slightly acidic conditions for this reaction. And so let's go ahead and draw what happens in this next step. This is where you, the acid comes into play. You can't, you get really slow rates if you run this reaction under basic conditions. And so that's the step. We're converting water into a leaving group. And you did that before. We, we had some chapter on alcohols uh, in the first quarter of organic chemistry where you learned that if you protonate alcohols, you can turn them into leaving groups. And that's what we're doing here. We're, we're converting the alcohol into a leaving group. But this one is so, so much better prepared to leave than any other alcohol uh, you, you've ever turned into a leaving group of here. But I'm not gonna draw all three bonds to the, to the oxygen. That's an oxonium ion, it has three bonds to oxygen. I'm not drawing all the bonds. And now right next door to that, that leaving group, this is not like an SN1 reaction that you saw back in, in the first quarter of organic chemistry. This is way better because that leaving group isn't just going to leave, it's going to be pushed out. Kind of, it kind of feels like an SN2 reaction. It's going to be pushed out. You can't stop this from happening. Let's do it. Oh, oh yeah. Right? I mean, you learned about the ionization of, of water molecules to leave carbocations, but this is way better. 
having a, a lone pair right next door push out the leaving group is way better than just leaving to give a carbocation. And the key intermediate that we generate here is the same type of intermediate we generated in the last reaction. It's called an aminium ion, super important reactive functional group. So I'll go ahead and draw the, the carbocation. That's called an aminium ion. Let me label that. It's so important. It's such an important intermediate. Aminium ion. Aminium ion. That's the aminium ion intermediate. And we're not done with the mechanism. Now, for the imine forming reaction, one of these two R groups was an H, and we just pulled off the H to leave a CN double bond. But there's no H's on the nitrogen now. We can't, those are alkyl groups on there. So if we're going to pull off a proton, we're going to have to get it from one of these carbons. So I might as well draw it there. Uh, oops, I'm going to do it in, in black. Um, <clears throat> so let me go ahead and draw out that, that one of those carbon hydrogen bonds. And that's what we're going to pull off. We're going to make a CC double bond in this mechanism. And so I'll draw uh, over here when I, when I deprotonated this, this acid, I left behind uh, a conjugate base. Here it is. I'll draw it over here. It's poised right next to that proton. And so our next step in the mechanism is that we're going to deprotonate. And I'm going to push these electrons all the way over to, to the aminium ion carbon. And we have to now break that pi bond. We can't have a fifth bond to that carbon and, and obey the octet rule. So we have to break that pi bond. Ooh, let me break it in, in our, our glorious red coloring here. There we go. Okay, so that deprotonation there leads to our final product uh, or in this mechanism, which is the thing you isolate, and that's the enamine. So let me go ahead and draw that enamine here in all of its glory. There's the alkene part, and you can see the amine part. It's an enamine. And I feel like this is probably one of the most challenging reactions in this chapter because the double bond, the, the atoms that used to be part of the double bond in the starting material, that's this carbonyl, you know, those end up being, those are not the atoms that have the double bond in the product. It's, it's the carbon-carbon atoms that end up forming the double bond. So this is, uh, this is the mechanism for formation of an enam, of a enamine. Very similar, right up into the last step. Uh, for forming the aminium ion intermediate. It's the same as the mechanism for forming an imine, uh, but the last step differs because we're deprotonating on carbon. Okay, that's a super important mechanism. Uh, now, you can run these reactions in, in reverse. Once you make an enamine, you can hydrolyze them. And we're not showing you the full breadth of chemistry that you can do with, with enamines, but these were super popular as synthetic intermediates back in the 1960s. Let me go ahead and draw out the, um, an enamine, and I'm going to start by showing an amine here. This, am, this amine, I haven't drawn the H on the amine, that would, that's called morpholine. It's another common cyclic amine that if, if I tell somebody to go grab a secondary amine off the shelf, it's going to be the five-membered ring pyrrolidine, or it's going to be the six-membered ring piperidine, or it's going to be this molecule called morpholine. Those are the common uh, secondary amines. And if you make an enamine out of morpholine and cyclohexanone, the product would look like this. <clears throat> How would you make that? You take cyclohexanone and you take morpholine and catalytic acetic acid, and you can make this. But if you're done with this, we can also hydrolyze these using acid. And this time we add water to the reaction. It's in equilibrium. So if you, if you dump in a bunch of water by Le Chatelier's principle, I'll just put water here as a solvent. I'm not going to draw it as an equilibrium, even though it is. I'm going to draw it as a chemical transformation where there's actual reagents. And we need a catalytic acid. You could do this with acetic acid. Nobody does that. <laughs> uh, but if you wrote ca catalytic acetic acid, that would be fine. Uh, I'm going to put more typical conditions, catalytic hydrochloric acid. Uh, everybody keeps bottles of, of hydrochloric acid at their bench. Most people don't keep bottles of acetic acid at their bench. So maybe you save yourself 10 steps to go walk over to the shelf <laughs> away from your bench and get acetic acids by using hydrochloric acid. Um, so maybe it's not much of a time saver. But Okay, so the product of the reaction is the same things you use to synthesize this in an enamine. You would synthesize the enamine from cyclohexanone, 
And then you also get back the amine part, which would be this part. And I expect you to know this reaction for hydrolyzing enamines. I would also expect you to know that you could hydrolyze, uh, um, hydrolyze imines as well. Now, if I used a full equivalent of hydrochloric acid, it would end up protonating the morpholine. So with one equivalent of HCl, I should draw the product as the ammonium chloride salt. It would protonate the amine. Amines are base are bases. They, they would get proton. But there's only a catalytic amount of HCl. You can't generate one equivalent of protonated amine if you didn't add one equivalent of HCl. So what's going on in here? I'm not going to draw out the whole mechanism. Um, but the mechanism for the reaction, right, what is that mechanism? The mechanism is the, the reverse of the mechanism for formation. The last step in enamine formation is, is deprotonation of the carbon atom. And that's, if you're going backwards and hydrolyzing, it means that's the first step. And it's not an obvious first step. Mechanistically, uh, what's going on here? Here's step one. The first step in this mechanism is you protonate. If I were to draw, I'm not going to draw the full curved arrow mechanism. But the, the first step in that curved arrow mechanism would be putting the proton back on um, that carbon atom. That's hard to see, right? If you, unless you've drawn out the mechanism for enamine formation and hydrolysis over and over, it seems like that's a hard, uh, but you know, again, I don't want to take the time to draw out this, the whole mechanism here. It, um, but it's kind of hard to see that, again, because it involves um, it, it involves you recognizing that, that this carbon atom right here is the carbon that gets protonated. That's the carbon atom that picks up the proton. It turns into a CH3 in the next intermediate. So again, this, this is a six step mechanism to go backwards, just like it was a six step mechanism to go forwards. Um, you know, this would be the mechanism for, for enamine hydrolysis. It would start with protonation of, of that of the alkene part of the enamine. And um, it's, the, it's the reverse of the formation mechanism. Wow, okay, enamines are super, um, super important. They were certainly super important in the 1960s. And when we get to chapter 23, we'll show you another class of, of carbon nucleophiles that took their place called enolates. They're, they're not really as important as important as they were back in the 1950s for, and 60s for organic synthesis. Okay, <clears throat> so what have we learned about in this chapter? We've learned about addition of HCN, cyanide anion, to carbonyl compounds, specifically to aldehydes and ketones. We've learned about addition of phosphonium illids to, to aldehydes and ketones. To do the Wittig reaction, you take CO double bonds and you convert them to CC double bonds. Then I showed you imine formation, where you take aldehyde and ketone carbonyls, CO double bonds, and you convert them to CN double bonds. And enamines are a little bit tricky because you form a, a, a you, you convert it to a, a slightly rearranged functional group, the aldehyde and ketone. Now we're going to talk about addition of oxygen nucleophiles to carbonyls. So, and I mentioned ahead of time, it's. Um, um, well, first let's go and talk about the transformation and then we can talk about mechanistically what's going on. So what I want to do is I want to start off by pointing out that if you take aldehydes, uh, and this is really, this happened, this is more important for aldehydes than, than most ketones, and you put them in water, the water will tend to add across that double bond and you can't stop this equilibrium from occurring you know, the reaction is governed by the equilibrium constant for the reaction, which is either good or bad. But you don't have any control over that. Okay, so in this case, if I take acetaldehyde and I mix and I just put it in water, I mix it with water, it's going to be in equilibrium with this species that we refer to as a hydrate. This is called a hydrate. This species where the water, H2O, has added across the CO double bond. This doesn't happen with esters, doesn't happen with amides, it's aldehydes and ketones that are in equilibrium with their hydrates. Now, let's go ahead and talk about that equilibrium constant. How much hydrate do you expect to be in there? If I just, if, if I just have some acid aldehyde, this is one of the big problems with acid aldehyde. When you get a bottle of it, it's extremely volatile. But you get any water in there, and all of a sudden you've got hydrate in there that you didn't want, and you can't 
really stop that. Well, the, the amount of hydrate that you form depends on uh, really how many H's are attached to the carbonyl. So uh, I'm going to come over here and I'm going to look at, at the hydrate derived from acetaldehyde. That's this one in the middle. This is the hydrate derived from acetaldehyde. At equilibrium, so let me go ahead and be clear about what I'm talking about. So I'm going to give you the amount of percent hydrate at equilibrium. If you mix the, out, the carbonyl compound at equilibrium and you mix it one-to-one -one with water in a one-to-one -one ratio, how much hydrate would be present? Well, it turns out for acetaldehyde, 58% of your acetaldehyde would be in this hydrate form if you just mix one equivalent of water and one equivalent of acetaldehyde. Wow. Now that's not very common. Acetaldehyde is an extremely reactive aldehyde. Um, it, the equilibrium is even more profound if you take formaldehyde. So formaldehyde has two H's. It's, it's just an insanely reactive uh, carbonyl compound. That exists 99.9% .9 as the hydrate in solution. In fact, when you buy, you, you can't readily buy formaldehyde. Nobody sells you just formaldehyde CH2O. Um, you typically buy aqueous solutions called formalin solutions, uh, which exists mostly as the hydrate. And you've heard of people, I think you might have heard that you can preserve biological specimens or tissues uh, for decades if you store it in formaldehyde solution, but it's really stored in formalin solution. It's a solution of this, um, of this, of this hydrate um, mixed with water and a little bit of methanol. That's not really important. Okay, so, but what about acetone? That's a more typical carbonyl compound. Acetaldehyde is not typical. That's a pain to work with. If you just mix acetone with water, it's freely miscible. There is a small amount of hydrate in there, but it's not much. Only 0.2% of the acetone molecules will exist in this hydrate form. It's not an issue of you synthesizing it. When you just expose acetone to water, there's a tiny amount of the hydrate in there. And you'd be able to see those OH stretches uh, if you didn't do something to dry out and suck away the water molecules, like add a drying agent or distill out the water and by Le Chatelier's principle, drive it all to the carbonyl. If you didn't remove the water, you'd end up with contaminated with a little bit of this uh, hydrate diol. So, you know, in organic chemistry, we always dry our, our products under high vacuum to, to evaporate off all the water and drive the equilibrium all the way to the carbonyls. We don't we don't mess around with these equilibria. We suck away all the water on purpose. And this is what would happen if you didn't purposely do that. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about what's happening here in these reactions. We can draw the, the mechanism for, um, for addition of, of water. Let me return back to the black pen here. Addition of water to, to aldehydes and ketones. There's a base catalyzed mechanism and there's an acid catalyzed mechanism. But really, the base catalyzed mechanism is completely useless. So there's no reason to talk about that because what we're going to do is in a couple of chapters, we'll show you what happens when you mix bases with aldehydes. And <laughs> hydrate formation is not the thing you need to be thinking about. So just forget anything about in the book about base catalyzed formation of hydrates. Uh, that's not worth anybody uh, mentioning or talking about. But we are interested in the acid catalyzed mechanism for formation of hydrates. So let's go ahead and talk about this. I mentioned that water is really not a powerful nucleophile, right? If I come over here and I look at this water molecule, it's got lone pairs. You know, those may be good for attacking carbocations, but an, a carbonyl group is not a carbocation. And, and you'd say the same thing with water. It's like if you had a water, or sorry, if you had an alcohol molecule, those lone pairs might be good for attacking carbocations, but you know, that's not a carbonyl compound is not a carbocation. So we need to protonate if we want the carbonyl oxygen, if we want to get good rates of attack. So let's go ahead and draw out the mechanism under acid catalyzed conditions. So I'm going to draw out, um, because we're doing an arrow pushing mechanism, I'm going to symbolize the acid as, as HA. And so the first step of our mechanism would be protonating the carbonyl. We didn't need to do this for amines. Amines are more than nucleophilic enough to attack a carbonyl. You don't have to do anything special. But, but for, to get an oxygen atom to attack, we really need to protonate this, this carbonyl. And so let's pick up a proton there. 
and this is all in equilibrium. You'll protonate it, you'll deprotonate it. It'll go back and forth over and over. And in reality, you're only going to have a small amount of this protonated carbonyl compound, which I might refer to that as an oxonium ion. It's oxygen with three bonds is called an oxonium. Uh, but more typically, I want you to know that there's a double bond on there, so I'll, I'll call it a protonated carbonyl. And once you protonate the carbonyl, now even a weak nucleophile like water or an alcohol now can attack that. Boy, with that O plus on there, it's super reactive. So now I can't wait to attack that, even with a crummy nucleophile like water. And then I'll push the electrons up to the carbonyl oxygen. That's, that's way easier to attack that carbonyl. And we didn't need to do that with amines or cyanide anion, but for oxygen nucleophiles, that's how we get this reaction going. Okay, so now we generate this next intermediate. It's a tetrahedral intermediate with four bonds to what used to be the carbonyl carbon. And here's my nucleophile. It's this, now it's got three bonds to oxygen. If you've got three bonds to oxygen, it's got to be a positive charge. There we go. That's an oxonium ion when you have three bonds to oxygen. Um, <clears throat> so now we've got that A minus still floating around. Let me go ahead and draw that, that conjugate base because now we can deprotonate the, um, that oxonium ion. And that's the mechanism for generation of the hydrate. And I expect you to know that. And so here's the hydrate of acid aldehyde. And you get back your acid catalyst, HA. So I'll just sketch it here, but that's not what we're really interested in. So what's the key feature of this mechanism? You have to protonate the carbonyl in order to make it the, so that oxygen nucleophiles can attack at reasonable rates. <clears throat> okay, pretty important chemistry, this idea of protonating a carbonyl to make it possible for, um, for an oxygen nucleophile to attack. Now let's go ahead and talk about, this is going to be a little bit more complex, but <clears throat> let's go ahead and talk about the uh, addition of alcohols to ketones and aldehydes. So we need strong acids here to make this happen. So I'm going to go ahead and take a... Um, just a generic version of a ketone with two different alkyl groups. It could be methyl and methyl, or methyl and ethyl, or phenyl and phenyl, or um, just not an ester or, or, or an amide carbonyl. So ketones or aldehydes. And if I mix this with an alcohol, um, <clears throat> I, I can get this to form two bonds, two new oxygen carbon bonds. Kind of like that hydrate, except this time with our alcohol. There we go. So a methoxy group on one side and a methoxy group on other. So let's note a couple of features of this reaction. And, and as before, we're going to lose water as a byproduct. So you typically have to suck the water out of the reaction mixture because equilibrium will naturally lie on the side of the ketone starting material. So you, you have to add special drying agents or distill out the water or this is not a good process. Well, one way to help drive the reaction towards the product side um, and a, a critical way to do that is if we use an excess of the alcohol. Le Chatelier's principle tells us um, that um, that it will drive an equilibrium process like this. This is an equilibrium. So you won't see this happening unless people are using an excess of, of the alcohol reagent. But there's something else we need to do here is we need to add a strong acid. And it's possible to do these with HCl. It's just not common. The only conditions I think they show you in this book for, for making these types of species called acetals. This is called an acetal. Let me write it out in, in, in red here, the word acetal. This is referred to as an acetal. People used to uh, nitpick and call, refer to ketone, ones derived from ketones as ketals, and these species derived from aldehydes as acetals. Uh, but this book just says, call everything an acetal. <laughs> Nobody cares whether you want to distinguish ketones and aldehyde products. We'll just call them all acetals, which makes good sense to me. Now, to get good rates out of this, we have to have 
remember, if you want methanol or any other oxygen nucleophile to attack the carbonyl at good rates, we have to add an acid. And invariably, the acid we add in this case is catalytic toluene sulfonic acid. And there's a few ways to abbreviate this. I'm going to show you a common abbreviation, P-T-S-O-H. And that's worth talking about. Why aren't we adding hydrochloric acid? Or why aren't we adding um, sulfuric acid or nitric acid? Well, nitric acid can be an oxidizing agent under some conditions. So paratoluene sulfonic acid should not be mysterious. You've seen tosyl chloride before, so paratoluene sulfonate groups should not be unusual. Why do we use this? Quite often the book also abbreviates it just as TSOH. Uh, TS stands for a toluene sulfonyl. So let me go ahead and draw out that toluene sulfonyl group and toluene sulfonic acid. And so why would this be so common as a strong acid in organic chemistry? Now, one reason is it's easy to synthesize. In fact, we taught you how to synthesize this. <laughs> the way you synthesize that is you take toluene, sulfur trioxide, and nitric acid, and you add a sulfonate group to the ortho and the para positions, and then you isolate the, the para product. And they sell buckets of this. We have huge quantities of these in all the synthetic organic chemistry labs here at UC Irvine. And why would we do this? It's got about the same strength, um, and I'll just write as strong as, about as strong as, and I'll write approx it's approximately the same as sulfuric acid, which is just a crazy powerful mineral acid. Mineral meaning there's no carbons in it. It's about as strong as sulfuric acid. So why wouldn't you use sulfuric acid? Well, the reason is the, the sulfuric acid comes in as, as a goopy liquid in this huge bottle. Of course, it's cheap, but it's inconvenient. If you just want to add three milligrams of sulfuric acid, it's hard to, to, to measure out three milligrams of this goopy liquid that's trying to burn everything it touches. That, that's actually really inconvenient. Um, but, it, but toluene sulfonic acid is a very convenient solid. Whoops, I'm misspelling convenient solid. And so you get the bottle of this powder and you can just weigh out a few grains of the powder. It's so easy. Um, because it's not a liquid, it, the, the reaction of solids with like your metal spatula is very slow. You don't have to worry about it corroding anything. So you just weigh out a few specks or milligrams or however much you want. It's so easy and so convenient to weigh out exactly how many milligrams you need on a balance. Um, and that's why we use toluene sulfonic acid. Could we use hydrochloric acid? In theory, yes but nobody does that. So the conditions they tell you in the book, toluene sulfonic acid, or if you want to leave out the para, because nobody uses ortho toluene sulfonic acid. Um, it, so catalytic toluene sulfonic acid is, is the most common conditions uh, for making uh, acetals out of aldehydes and ketones <clears throat> under these conditions that I'm showing you. Now, you really need to have the alcohol present in excess in order to drive this equilibrium. It's an equilibrium reaction. And so let's go ahead and acknowledge the fact that it, um, that it, you just need to use an excess of the alcohol. And if that's true, you want to use cheap alcohols. There's not that many alcohols that are so cheap. You can use them in vast excess and then throw them away when you're done. And that's pretty much methanol and ethanol are the common ones. I'll show you one other common one that gives even better yields. So whenever you take a common solvent and you draw that molecule below the arrow like hexane tetrahydrofuran dichloromethane if i draw it below the the reagent arrow that means it's being used as a solvent and that means it's present in excess so if you draw that molecule below the arrow that means you're using it in excess and you don't have to indicate excess but if you simply draw it as a reagent over here like plus a you have to write the word excess next to that. But when it's below the arrow here, down below here, th that implies that it is in excess. What if it was sodium chloride? Well, you know, that's not a solvent. So even if you write sodium chloride below the arrow, nobody's going to assume that that's present in excess because you can't use table salt as a solvent for your reaction. So, so this is only true for common solvent molecules, methanol, ethanol, 
tetrahydrofuran, ether. Um, those are some of the common solvents that we work with in the lab. Now recall, we need a, um, a catalyst for this reaction. I just told you the one uh, catalyst that's common. It's going to be catalytic toluene sulfonic acid. In this case, I'm going to leave off the little p. I think the book st starts to do that and just write it toluene sulfonic acid. And that TS, uh, I'll come back and show you clarify that abbreviation for you in a second. So in this case, if we start with uh, an aldehyde, right, we'll, we'll end up with an acetal derived from the aldehyde. And there we go. And you get a, a water byproduct in this reaction. So, so just remember that when common solvent molecules are drawn below the arrow, that implies it's being used as the solvent and that, that relieves you of your requirement to write the word excess implies. So that means it's present in excess, simply drawing it below the arrow. Okay, and again, what is this TS group? The TS, the TS stands for, TS is equal to this. It's a tolyl, toluene group, tolyl functional group, attached to a sulfonyl. And when you write TSOH like this over here, right, it says that there's still an OH over on the other end of the, there would be an OH over here. And, and you should already be familiar with tosyl chloride. So, um, you know, back in the first quarter of organic chemistry, you learned you could use toluene sulfonyl chloride to convert alcohols into tosylate leaving groups. So that should not be a new abbreviation for you. But the last thing for us to talk about is there's one, you know, if you really want good yields for these reactions, you need something extra to help drive these reactions forward. Um, it's too easy for these methanol groups to fly off of there. And so even when you're using all these tricks of excess methanol, toluene sulfonic acid, and trying to, we, we have these drying agents that we dump into the reaction to help suck water out of the reaction, um, you still don't get the best yields. If you really want a good yield of an acetal and you don't care about the structure of the acetal, cyclic acetals are the way to go. So let me show you how you make an acetal if you just want an acetal, if you just want to convert a, an aldehyde or a ketone into an acetal, and you don't care what acetal, then we make um, then we want to make cyclic acetals. And I'll show you the alcohol that you need to use to make that happen. So we're going to use catalytic toluene sulfonic acid. But instead of using methanol, we're going to use kind of something like two methanols put together. And this is the one common reagent that makes the that makes acetals. Uh, it's the most common reagent for making acetals. It's called ethylene glycol. That's not an IUPAC name. It's an old-fashioned name. So if you took benzaldehyde, and because the acetal is cyclic, the equilibrium lies more heavily over towards this side of making a ring. And there's entro entropy comes into play. That's why it's just entropically more favorable to make the second carbon oxygen bond when it can attack intramolecularly. So this is, of course, there's an H on the aldehyde. I'm not gonna draw that H there. So this is the acetal derived from benzaldehyde. Why would you do this? Well, let's suppose you wanted to make a Grignard reagent out of this. You're not gonna be making any Grignard reagents when there's aldehydes somewhere else in your flask. So forget that. <laughs> the only way you're gonna make that bromine into a Grignard reagent is if you first protect, do something to get rid of that carbonyl group. And so if you take the aldehyde here and you convert it into an acetal, bases and nucleophiles don't touch acetals. They are completely unreactive towards bases. So let me just write that here. That's a key reason for you to want to make turn carbonyl groups. Uh, um, and I'll talk about this when we come back. Acetals don't react with bases or nucleophiles. They're resistant to basic and nucleophilic conditions. So you can go to town with Grignard reagents and super powerful bases, and that's just gonna sit there and be chill until you expose it to strong acid and water. So if you wanna, then when you wanna turn it back to a carbonyl, you just, any acid that you got on your shelf and some water, and that's gonna fall apart to give up back the aldehyde carbonyl. We'll talk about that when we come back. All right. Uh, <clears throat> keep working problems.
uh, in, in the book, Keep Working Problems on Our Online Homework Systems. And uh, thanks for coming to my lecture again. And, uh, and, and thanks for joining me in, in learning about carbonyl chemistry, which is really uh, one of the most exciting areas of organic chemistry.